hello everyone. How y'all doing? Thank you for coming out on this uh, blustery evening. Uh, I'm Faye Rosenfeld. I am the Vice President of Public Programs here at the New York Public Library. And so welcome to Live from NYPL. Whether you're here with us in person or you're joining us online, uh, we're really happy to have you with us. So we are here tonight to celebrate the launch of Angela Saini's brilliant new book, The Patriarchs, How Men Came to Rule. The book explores a question that I am sure many of us have asked ourselves time and time again, why the heck do we live in a patriarchy and what can we do to smash it? <laughs> this is not a theoretical question, it is a burning question, one that becomes ever more urgent day by day as women's rights to control our own bodies and destinies and to live as free and equal human beings are rolled back here in our own country and in societies around the world. This is not an acceptable state of affairs and Angela's book reminds us that it hasn't always been that way and it doesn't have to be this way. So we're really honored to have her with us today and to have the amazing Nona willis Aronowitz joining her in conversation. Both of their uh, really illustrious bios are in your printed programs and I encourage you to read those. Copies of The Patriarchs, How Men Came to Rule uh, will be on sale in the back of the room if you're here with us in person and Angela will be signing copies so please stick around for that. If you're watching online, you can purchase a copy via the link in the chat and in both cases, all purchases benefit the New York Public Library. In addition, if you have a library card, which I'm assuming everyone here does, right? <laughs> you can check out um, a copy of the book at your favorite branch um, or via our Simply E app. So March, uh, as we all know, is designated as Women's History Month, month um, Women's History Month, something that we probably would not need if we did live in a patriarchy, but I'll leave that for another time. Here at the New York Public Library, Women's History Month is an occasion for conversations, offering reflection and insight like tonight's event and others that you can find listed in your printed programs and that I hope that you'll attend. But it's also an occasion for celebration. So on that note, I invite you all to join us on Friday, March 31st for our biggest and most joyous celebration of the year, the Library After Hours, which we are so excited to be bringing back after a three-year hiatus. It's gonna take place at our iconic main building right across the street uh, on the corner of 42nd Street and Fifth Avenue. Um, and the theme is fittingly icons of women's history. We're gonna keep the building open late and fill it top to bottom with amazing activities celebrating iconic women from our collections, from Lorraine Hansberry to Joan Didion to Marsha P. Johnson and many, many more. We're going to have a special uh, one night only collections display and tours of our exhibitions and activities and music in the gorgeous Rosemain Reading Room. Um, lots more, including a bar and DJ and dancing and Astor Hall. So um, tickets for this are going fast. And uh, if you want to come, please go to nypl.org slash live and sign up. Uh, there's a link there. And I really hope that you can all join us. In just a moment, I'm gonna bring our speakers on stage. They're gonna speak for around 45 minutes and then they'll take your questions. If you're in the room and you wanna ask a question, you'll notice that there are note cards on your seats. Um, one of our wonderful staff members will come around and collect your questions. If you're watching online, you can just drop your questions into the chat um, or you can send us an email at publicprograms at nypl.org and um, our speakers will get to as many questions as they can. Live from NYPL is made possible by the continuing generosity of Celeste, Bar Celeste Bartos, Manaz Ispahani Bartos, and Adam Bartos. And of course, by all of you, our wonderful f friends and supporters near and far. Uh, on behalf of the New York Public Library, I really wanna thank you for that support. It's incredibly meaningful and important to us, especially right now as libraries in New York, as you may have read, are facing the most drastic budget cuts uh, in years. Uh, it's really, um, it's really quite, quite dramatic. Um, if you've walked around this building on your way up and you saw all of the incredible activities that take place on the eight floors of this building, from Children's Center on the bottom to this amazing event space up here, to everything in between, um, we really, we really rely on the city's support for all of that to be happening. Um, 
So if you love libraries, and I know that you all do, uh, we invite you to please let the mayor and the city council know. You can go to nypl.org slash speak out to sign a letter asking the city to restore the library's funding and so that we can continue to keep doing all this wonderful programming here and in our 92 locations around the city. Okay, that's my spiel. <laughs> now, uh, let's get on with the program. Please welcome Angela Saini and Nona willis Aronowitz. Hi, everyone. My name is Nona willis Aronowitz. Um, I'll be asking the questions, and I'll be looking at my phone, but I'm not being rude. It's just the questions. Um, I loved this book. I'm a sucker for turning to little-known history in order to make ourselves feel better about our current moment. I think a lot of things, not just patriarchy, feel very in inevitable and sort of um, stagnant, and like they'll always be like that, and they've always been like that. And that's just this is just one of those books that makes you remember that's actually not the case. So I'm really excited to talk about this book tonight, and I think I, I want to start with sort of a meta question about exactly that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, I think even the most erudite and thoughtful people often think about patriarchy as inevitable and biological. And I, mm -hmm. I kind of want to know, when you when you started your work, were science, I mean, I know you're part of the science write, writing community, and you're probably surrounded by extremely thoughtful people. And I'm wondering, even people who think about this kind of thing all the time, um, what were their impressions? And like, did how widespread is this idea still that patriarchy is biological or inevitable? And what were like the main culprits that people around you were assuming were the reason okay. for patriarchy? Well, <laughs> first of all, I'm so grateful to all of you for coming, especially in this weather. I was a little bit nervous that nobody would turn up. Oh, sorry. I was a little bit worried that nobody would turn up because of the snow. So thank you for being here. Um, and yeah, we imagine patriarchy often when we use that word, and it's not used that much in feminist literature these days, it went out of favor around the 1990s, but in everyday language, when we use that word, it's often in a really monolithic way, that here is this big, um, huge thing that uh, controls all of our lives, however much we chip away at it, it's always going to be there in the end, uh, we will never get rid of it completely, and, um, you know, the we become almost fatalistic about it then. You know, we don't imagine it as something real that has a history. And certainly, you know, in answer to your question, um, we do think of it, you know, when I ask people generally, they will say, well, men are bigger than women slightly, so surely uh, patriarchy has its roots in that, or, you know, religion is a culprit. We have these folk ideas, assumptions that um, are there in the literature, in the everyday way that we use this phrase, this term, and what I want to do with this book is just say, well, actually, what is it really? What is patriarchy? If you break it down into its parts, what does it really look like? And it doesn't look like this big universal monolith. It doesn't feel um, abstract anymore. It feels tangible and real. And uh, the age of it really depends on where you are in the world. The form it takes really depends on where you are in the world, which is why I say that there isn't this kind of one overarching patriarchy, what we have are many different patriarchies that um, are context specific, depending on where and when you are. And they're always mutating. And in fact, we're still creating these structures even now. We're still building patriarchy now. It's not something that existed in the past, and now we're kind of living with the legacy of it. This is something that is continually recreated all the time. Yeah. Um, and actually, that's a perfect segue to my next question, which is sort of um, about the nature of society in general. I know we're getting already extremely broad, but I was struck by how a lot of the societies that you looked at, with the exception of Chattel, Hoyek, and a couple of others, mm -hmm. you were giving examples of matriarchal society, like matrilineal societies, um, where women had power, they were sort of considered the primary gender. Um, 
as a contrast to patriarchal society. And I, as a kind of modern feminist, always saw a contrast to patriarchal societies as like gender equal societies. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I always, I guess that's, it's not um, a universal way that feminists think about that because I, I, I do think there were w women even in the second wave feminist movement who were espousing qualities that women had that were better than men and so they should rule the world. But mm -hmm. in my circles, it's that's the goal, the gender equal societies. And I'm wondering sort of, because you focused on matrilineal versus patriarchy, is it really sort of hierarchy that's the universal thing rather than gender essentialist power? Like, are we really just talking about how power structures society? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, um, one of the first places I visited when I was writing this book was, um, as you say, Chattelhuyuk. So I'm sure you guys have heard of this place. It's um, an ancient settlement in southern Anatolia in Turkey, not very far from where the earthquakes re recently happened. And um, this site is 9,000 years old. So just to help you get your head around that, that is many thousands of years old, years older than the first pyramids in Egypt. It's older by thousands of years in Stonehenge or Harappa. It predates writing. It's one of the oldest uh, and most sophisticated settlements of that of the Neolithic that we have. Um, and what's incredible about it is that um, this isn't some kind of uh, basic hunter-gatherer um, society. Uh, the houses there, and you can, there are things that we recognize from the modern day, um, like a hearth and, you know, the room structure. But instead of there being windows and doors, um, people would um, have a hole in their roof and there would be a ladder and you would go up and up and down that ladder and conduct your business at the top of your house because there would be no way out any other way. So kind of houses were back together. And um, new generations of this settlement will be built on top of the old ones there are these beautiful, vivid red frescoes on the walls of um, hunting scenes and uh, vultures tearing apart dead bodies, bullhorns in the in the walls, um, and lots of female figurines. I mean, this is uh, why the Neolithic is so fascinating for feminists and has been since the 1960s when Chattelhuyuk was first excavated because we see so many female figurines from that era, the most famous of which is the seated woman of Chattelhuyuk, which is, is around this high and incredibly arresting. So here we have an image of an older woman. Um, you can see these beautiful rolls of fat kind of spilling out around her, a body clearly weathered by age. And um, she's holding both her, she's, her back is completely straight. She's holding her two arms outstretched. And underneath each of her hands is what looks like a big cat or a domesticated animal, but a very large domesticated animal under each hand. And that vision of authority from 9,000 years ago, female authority from 9,000 years ago, was hugely confusing to <laughs> experts and archaeologists from that era because, of course, we were still living with this idea that prehistory was necessarily patriarchal, that women have always had less agency and authority in the past than they do now, that equality is some kind of recent invention. Um, and we still retain, if you look at the archaeological and historical literature, this idea that the past was almost like the Flintstones, that we, you know, we lived in caves, the Neo Neolithic people lived in nuclear families in which Fred went out and did the hunting and the gathering <laughs> and, you know, Wilma stayed back and looked after the children and did the household work. And you can see even in the Flintstones this incredible size difference between uh, these two people. Um, and that's how, you know, we project our ideas about gender onto the past in that way. But in Chattelhuyuk, every single measure we have of gender inequality, um, whether it is the work that people did, how they ate, burials, the size difference, shows that men and women did pretty much the same thing. There is no real difference in how they lived, how they were treated. We cannot say that Chattelhuyuk was patriarchal. We can't necessarily say, even though there are so many f female figurines, that it was matriarchal. What we do know is people lived very similar lives. So we can't necessarily look then to prehistory and say that patriarchy dates from this period because we genuinely do not have the evidence for that. We just don't. Even in uh, this region, in the Americas, in 2018, uh, remains were found 
uh, in the Peruvian Andes of what was clearly a hunter between around 17 or 19 years old, buried with all these stone implements, including projectile points and knives. So clearly the burial of a hunter. And yet when the remains turned out to be female, as archaeologists later discovered, um, again, there was this shock. <laughs> People would say <laughs> bizarre things like, do these objects actually belong to this person? Do they belong to somebody else? Are they there by accident? Did they fall in? All kinds of weird explanations that people come up with, which of course they wouldn't have posited at all had the remains been male. Um, you know, there was one archaeologist who didn't work on this and was not involved even in the subsequent analysis who told um, National Geographic magazine at the time, you can't just stop in the middle of hunting to nurse a crying baby. And so that's all that, you know, young women of that era ever did. But, you know, that comment itself, and this is a very prominent archaeologist, incredibly influential, what that comment tells you is that we cannot imagine even now, scholars can't even imagine, that women had any role beyond childcare and nurturing even 9,000 years ago. But actually, if you look at all remains, hunting remains, so remains of hunters, um, in the Americas from 9,000 years and prior, we have an equal number of male and female hunters. So again, we cannot say that big game hunting was necessarily a gendered activity in this part of the world in prehistory. Um, and, you know, what, <laughs> what amazes me is that we have all this evidence, and not just that, from later we have evidence of women military leaders, women warriors, women hunters, women in power in many different parts of the world, and yet our underlying narrative never changes. All that happens is that these stories become footnotes to the main story, which is the past was patriarchal, that we have always been male-dominated. It's really time, given all the evidence that we have, for us to be led by the evidence rather than by our stories and say maybe our narrative is what needs changing now. Yeah, I mean, I think that confronts one of the biases I even had reading this book, which is that, I mean, you even said it yourself in the book that Chattahoyuk, I mean, it's like, it was like a settlement, and it was 9,000 years ago, it was before these giant civilizations, and I, I mean, I've, again, as a feminist, I've always heard people say, um, well, what about the, like, matriarchal societies? What about the matrilineal societies? And I'd always, in the back of my mind, think, well, yeah, but they weren't very in influential, were they? Because <laughs> look what happened. Um, and I guess my question is sort of what's the problem with that statement? And mm -hmm. like what um, if patriarchy, since we look around and not exclusively, but the vast majority of um, societies are patriarchal, what do we make of settlements like, Chattahoyuk are like relatively smaller. I mean, I think there's an assumption like, oh, those were all hunter-gatherer societies or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like if you're talking about real civilization, it's mm -hmm. all patriarchal. What would you say to someone who had that bias? Well, it wasn't a hunter-gatherer society. It was a mixed society. No, and not that society. Uh, but but yeah. others, yeah. So often we kind of marginalize any society that, <laughs> that isn't male-dominated as though, you know, these are remnants of something else or quirky in some way. In fact, right. anthropologists even have a phrase, the matrilineal puzzle, to describe the way that they're still trying to figure out why is it that these societies exist and what are the conditions under which they will inevitably decline. I only have one illustration in my book, and it's a map of all the existing today matrilineal societies in the world, and they are everywhere except Europe. Um, you see them <laughs> right across a Asia. There's an entire matrilineal belt across Africa, um, all across the Americas, because many Native American societies, of course, indigenous societies, were and are matrilineal. Um, and each of them are different. You know, there are some societies, for example, um, the Moswo um, in China, in which um, women practice uh, something that has been termed walking marriage. So instead of um, a woman actually getting married, it's not really marriage at all. Um, when a, uh, Everyone lives in their mother's house. When a girl comes of age, she is given a chamber inside her mother's house and she can invite a man in and he leaves the next day. And that's as far as marriage goes. And then it might be a different man the next time. Um, but she will always live in her mother's house and her children will live in her mother's house. And in fact, the father of her children will be raising his sister's children. 
Um, so every single society is different. It's set up in its own way. And in the past, the further back we go, the more social variation we would have seen. What's odd about how we live now is not the matrilineal puzzle. It really is the patriarchal one. Why is it that this particular form of gender depression, which is so skewed and really does disadvantage most of us, men and women, why has this become so common why has this spread? And that's not to say that social systems can't spread even if they disadvantage a lot of people. Arguably, capitalism could be, could be termed one of those. It's still very common. It doesn't ad advantage everyone. But, um, you know, I would argue this has served the elites very well. It's been spread over centuries by those in power because it essentially what patriarchy does is it's, at its core is create a class of people who will work for you for free. Right. Yeah. I mean, and you also describe it as um, like a global export, like colonialism. Yeah. Um, I found it really interesting in your book that you used as evidence the fact that for every patriarchal society, there's always women fighting against that standard. Mm -hmm. There's very few societies where nobody seems to realize that that, that disadvantages everybody. Um, can you talk more about uh, uh, why you th think that's an indicator of it not being natural? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, for the sake of argument, you know, we fight against a lot of things that are natural all the mm -hmm. time. And I'm wondering why that struck you as mm -hmm. some evidence that um, patriarchy is not natural. Well, I'm not leaving aside the possibility that there are biological factors that might lead men to dominate in society. That's a possibility. You know, there may be, even if we haven't fully identified them yet. What I'm saying is, if that's all we have as an explanation, then there is no hope for us. <laughs> you know, this will just continue forever because this is how it's always been. Um, and the evidence just doesn't tally with that. If it was true, if it was truly biological, then surely patriarchy would be universal. There would be no matrilineal societies. You wouldn't see women in positions of authority anywhere. And it would be timeless. And in fact, none of those things are true. So we have to be able to offer alternatives. Why do we resign? You know, we don't do this with race. We don't do this with class. Why is it that with gender depression, we resign ourselves to this likelihood that this is just natural? that we just have to live with it, or that when we fight for gender equality, we're somehow struggling against our natural instincts, that this is against the grain of human nature. If you look at when you see the first roots of gender depression, it is not, like I said, in prehistory. It's, it's not even at the start of agriculture. So often you will, you will hear, for example, anthropologists say that agriculture was the turning point because that's when uh, you start to get property and men are keen to claim that property and um, make sure it is transferred to their legitimate heirs. So that's when they started to control female sexu sexuality and sexual behavior. And again, we don't see that. We have agriculture for a very long time, right. uh, animal and plant domestication for a very long time before you see any kind of gender depression. Um, and in fact, if the seated woman of Chattelhuyuk is anything to go by, you know, here is a society in which domestication was starting to happen. Women were involved too. They still are. Many, if not most, of the subsistence farmers in the world, whenever this happens, I blame the patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> but whenever you see, um, you know, all over the world, there are women heavily involved in agriculture doing very hard work. It's not as though you see a huge division of labor universally. So it's at the start, it's when the first states start to emerge that things really change. So this is in Mesopotamia, in ancient Assyria. Um, and the reason is, the big reason is population. Right. It's not property, unless you count population as property. But just imagine, in these very early states, you have these people who um, are in charge. And what they desperately need is for people not to leave. And it's hard for us to imagine this now because you're born into a state and you become a citizen automatically and um, it's very hard for you to, you know, just go where you want and be stateless or just, uh, you know, become a citizen elsewhere. But, of course, in prehistory, that wouldn't have been the case. You could have just left. You could have just gone and become a hunter-gatherer again or done something else or gone to live somewhere else. Um, so in these early states, what you see is... Um, 
this obsession with population. And because of this obsession with population, you get, an, you get a kind of concentrated interest in what happens within the family. You need young women to have as many children as possible, and you need young men to defend the state, of course. So you need people to be loyal, and you need them to have large families. Um, and this is where you start to see states imposing these uh, this categorization on people and these really rigid gender rules, even against their own will. So even in ancient Mesopotamia, you can see people struggling against what the state is telling them. There is a case of one man who um, is dying without any sons, and he can only pass property to his sons according to the state. So what does he do? He, he, uh, he designates one of his daughters as a son. He changes her official gender in order for her to fulfill that role, which otherwise he wouldn't be able to do. And there are loads of cases like this, of people negotiating the terms of divorces, terms of marriage, um, trying to work, trying to carve out some individuality for themselves in systems which are becoming more and more rigid, which are saying that as a man, you can only do this, and as a woman, you can only do this. And that, in fact, is these are still obsessions of states today. If you look at... Um, anywhere in the world, as soon as birth rates start to fall, there is panic. You know, people get very nervous. Um, the first uh, state in the world to legalize abortion was the Soviet Union in 1920, under its commitment to gender equality. But Stalin later reversed that because birth rates were falling, and then it was reintroduced again. Um, or if you look at, for example, conscription, military service, many countries in the world still have military service. In Israel, men and women have it. Um, we can see in Russia now all these young men who don't want to fight, possibly aren't even capable of being the fighters that the state need them to be, but they don't have a choice because that's the bargain we make when we become citizens. This is the gendered order that's been created, and that is really when you start to see the first institutionalized um, form of patriarchy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I find it, I mean, I've, obviously been thinking a lot about what happens when a society who previously had legal abortion no longer has legal abortion and how that felt very just sort of against the the march of progress that I was so used to and that that that's kind of the um narrative that we're all told like it's gonna get more and more progressive and more and more um just women and marginalized identities are going to be more and more free. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, this was simultaneously comforting and terrifying. What your book is really saying is um, that that's not necessarily the case, that it can happen and turn on a dime, that um, something very violent and very sudden can happen, like the story of the Kurgans, you know, um, which I, I kind of, I know I said I wasn't going to do this actually, <laughs> but I feel like if you told one story from your book, it would be that story because there's this very compelling chapter about how there's, you pinpointed this kind of shift, you know, and it was, it was a specific era. Um, Tell us a little bit more about that, and then mm. I'll continue my question. <laughs> <laughs> so there was, um, if we go back uh, 200 years ago, um, this was the first time, really, that in European thought, people first started asking the question of, have we um, always been male-dominated? Where did patriarchy come from? And part of the reason for that was in the middle of the 19th century, of course, there were all these social movements, revolutions happening all over the world. In 1848, you get the first Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls. And um, people are also seeing people live in different ways, not least in the United States, in New York State, in fact, people were looking at indigenous communities that were matrilineal, in which women had so much authority, and saying, if we really are creating a society at the forefront of equality and egalitarianism, how is it that the people who already live here have had this for hundreds of years, and we're just having to fight for that now? Um, so there was all this confusion. How do you resolve that? How do you resolve the fact that Haudenosaunee women have um, clan mothers who still run government at the local level, in which they have a huge amount of agency and power. They run agriculture. They are matrilineal. Names are passed from 
mother to daughter over generations. Um, how do we square that with the fact that we thought that we were the most civilized people on the planet, that you know, we were at the front of progress. If, if we are becoming more civilized as a species, that we are the most civilized. And the way they reconciled that was to say, um, well, actually, these societies are remnants of the past. They are primitive and we are modern. Um, so you get anthropologists like Henry Lewis Morgan and Friedrich Engels, who co-wrote the Communist Man Manifesto, buying into this idea that matriarchy was the form of living in the past and that patriarchy is the kind of natural progression out of that as men wise up, you know, as they figure, figure things out and realize that they should be in charge. And Morgan really believed that that was a natural way of things, that's how it should be, and that the, these kind of old societies were hanging on to something that had to disappear, um, which is an incredibly racist idea when you think about it. And yet you still see that. People still make this claim that we were matriarchal, we were all matriarchal before, and then we became patriarchal. Well, there are still matrilineal societies now. Those societies are still modern. They just came up with different ways of organizing themselves that worked for them. That doesn't mean they're any less modern because of it. it. Just because they've been around for longer, that doesn't tell you anything about how modern they are or how civilized they are. Um, and that, had a, that left a very long shadow. That idea left a very long shadow over this question for more than a century. Uh, if we skip forward to the 1970s and 1980s when feminists really started to grapple with this and ask, okay, then how do we imagine the past, the possibility of a more equal future given how we used to live? And they came back to this. I mean, Gloria Steinem still repeats this idea that we were all matriarchal once and then there was this, in Friedrich Engels' words, this kind of world historical defeat of the female sex and that changed everything. Um, and out of this, you get um, archaeologists like Maria Gimbutas arguing that we can see evidence of these uh, matriarchal societies in the past and that there was this catastrophic turning point, which brings us to the Kurgans, which you mentioned. So there was this belief that uh, in prehistory, there had been in, uh, the time that Europe had changed, the point at which Europe had become patriarchal, was when there had been this huge invasion of people from the Eurasian steppes into these peaceful, egalitarian, female-centered society, that these incomers were, um, you know, these male-centered, militaristic, patriarchal invaders, and they had changed everything, that before we had goddesses, and then we had gods. Um, and it's not that clean, unfortunately. I wish it was that clean. I mean, it's not literally that clean. No. But there was a moment where I was reading that and I was like, that's very specific. Like, mm -hmm. not only have I never heard of this moment, but it also does feel tangible in some way. Not clean, but tangible. Something happened. Mm -hmm. There was violence. There was this one, it was in a specific geographic lo location. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think that, People, when they try to think about patriarchy, it's so big and so widespread that they don't think of specific incidents precipitating mm -hmm. anything, which is not mm -hmm. true for a lot of other big concepts. Like people, you know, the fall of Rome, for instance, <laughs> is like a very key um, moment in Western society for other reasons. And mm -hmm. like, why don't we have a fall of Rome for patriarchy? Mm -hmm. um, and so I was really struck by that. And figured that was a good way to talk about really the tone of this book and what it's saying about the future. I mean, I fi found it to be a very hopeful book because again, if something if things can change so quickly um, and relatively suddenly, I mean, in, the spread of patriarchy was gradual, but you describe a lot of moments in which things turned over pretty quickly, including in the Soviet Union um, with mm -hmm. W women's gender equality in the workplace. And um, this is modern history I can really grasp. And um, again, with the Roe v. Wade overturning, um, or later you're talking about the Iranian Revolution where um, that wasn't a linear, that wasn't an example of linear progress. It did not go the way that mm -hmm. the feminists want it to go. Mm -hmm. I actually sought comfort in all these other examples of, well, that can change too. It's not like it's not like patriarchy is always going to be there or always going to win in every case. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of wondering, 
I kind of want to hear more about what, how you think that this book that's about history relates to our current moment and the, and the future. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't think we can take anything for granted. Um, there is no guarantee that just because we change a social system, just because we have a revolution, we will necessarily end up with a more liberal or progressive outcome. Um, and we see that again and again in so many societies all over the world. But part of the reason for that is that who decides what a new society is going to look like is really dependent on so many different factors. So just going back to the 19th century, you know, like I said, people would look at the Haudenosaunee and they would say, here is this paradox, how do we fix this? And their answer at that time was to civilise indigenous Americans into patriarchy, which is exactly what they did. You know, this is why children were sent to these boarding schools in which girls would be taught to be, ha in New York State, girls were taught to be housewives and uh, boys were taught to do agricultural work. Women were being forced in some societies to name their children after the fathers, which they had never done before. And there was this huge tension within families about how to get around this. How can we not have to do this? Gradually, women who had been involved in trade and agriculture, who had had kind of a leading role in that, were sidelined by uh, colonial settlers who would only do trade with the men. So bit by bit, you know, cultural norms were shifted. Christian missionaries started shunting people away from female-centered religious beliefs into Christianity and these really rigid patriarchal ideas about the divine, um, making people believe that their way of doing things was backward. Um, and you see this again and again in uh, 19th century and early 20th century colonial um, attempts to change gender norms all over the world. Um, and I'm, you know, I don't want to place all the blame at the door of European colonialists because I have to add here that empires and, and colonies throughout history have done this right the way back for thousands of years of, of different forms and different types. Um, but this is a history that we have a hold of. We can see it. It's within living memory. People still remember it, and we have very good written evidence for it. So we can, within our own lifetime, track how it was that societies went from being matrilineal to patriarchal. And what we see is not, often it is not hugely violent. Often it is very slow and gradual. It is done um, in this very insidious way that changes how people think about themselves this is the most powerful thing about it. They can completely transform the way you think about your own family, um, create divisions where divisions didn't exist between parents and their children, husbands and wives. All these relationships get destroyed. Um, and it happens in full plain sight of everyone. We can see it happening. Um, and that, you know... That should be a lesson for us now that just because in some parts of the world the last 150 years have seen social progress for women, in other parts of the world in which they already had matrilineal traditions, we've actually seen exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, this is a good time to take questions. Um, I saw somebody, it's kind of hard to see in general, but I think I saw somebody with some index cards. Um, Thank you. Thank you. This always takes longer than we think, so this I'm giving you guys a couple more minutes. Okay, the first question is, do you see similar fighting against matriarchal communities looking to overthrow that, fo that form of hierarchy as you see in patriarchy? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not... Uh, this isn't a binary option that we have. It's not as though matriarchy is the or matrilineal societies are the mirror opposites of patriarchal societies. Uh, they're very different. Every single one is very different. And in some, you do see social tension. So, for example, in the northeast of India, the Khasi community, there is a new men's rights movement there <laughs> that has emerged in recent decades, which is fighting for men to have uh, the right to name their children after them. Um, and it's a small kind of fight, but there are, there are questions about whether uh, there could legally be a more equal and um, egalitarian way of dividing property instead of passing it to daughters, maybe 
uh, dividing it up more equally, and the same with the names of the children. So you do see social tension. We have to remember, though, social tension is part of being human. It has always existed. In no society do you see this kind of static form of social organisation where everyone's always happy all the time. Even in Chattel Huyuk, if you look at different layers, which, of course, represent different periods of time, you can see tension at certain times, and then that resolves itself, and then people you know, settle into a new pattern. This is how we have always lived. Um, the problem is now, of course, that um, we have become ossified in the societies that we're in. Even to have a tiny bit of legislative change takes huge effort. It's so difficult to be socially nimble now. And if we really are going to build a new society the way that we want, we have to be able to rediscover that ability to be socially nimble, to, to change things dramatically without having to kind of push that boulder up the mountain every single time. Mm -hmm. um, you spoke a little bit about this, but I think it. I agree with this commenter that it deserves a little bit more attention. Can you speak about the impact of major religions characterizing God as a male figure? Mm. Like you talk a lot about goddesses, <laughs> the goddess to God pipeline in your book. Uh, can you yep. say a little um, more about that? I talk a lot about goddesses. So my family heritage is in India. Um, and my mom is Hindu and there are a lot of goddesses in Hinduism. And in fact, um, Hindu gods and goddesses are very transgressive anyway. You know, they very rarely follow any kind of consistent social ideas that we might have about masculinity or femininity. And in fact, I open the book with the goddess Kali, who, if you have seen depictions of her, in fact, she is such a kind of hugely transgressive figure that um, in the 19th century, early 20th century, she became a symbol of anti-colonialism in India because British authorities were so frightened of her, even just to see images of her. Here we have this, you know, this blue-skinned, um, woman with this huge curly mass of hair her tongue is lolling out there's blood everywhere in her outstretched arms she's holding the head of a demon dripping blood another one holding a sword you know a string of heads around uh, decapitated heads around her waist a string of um arms kind of you know disembodied arms hanging off her uh, in some depictions of her she has entire corpses strung through her earlobes so this is a you know incredibly powerful image um, and not at all consistent with kind of European gentle genteel ideas or even these days you know Indian ideas of femininity and passivity subservience this is an incredibly powerful goddess um, and the big question is always, you know, how do we have goddesses like this in, a, in societies which feel so patriarchal? But again, these are products of a time in which norms would not have been the same as we imagine them now. Um, even in antiquity, in ancient Greece, which is ancient Athens, which is one of the most misogynistic times and places in human history in which if you read any kind of literature there's just this seething frothing hatred of women um, there are still these very powerful goddesses there is still this idea that you know we are not entirely comfortable with gender norms as they are because they don't really reflect reality this this ongoing tension between the demands of the state and how people actually live and how they actually are um, this fear of transgression. When Christianity first emerged as a cult in antiquity, it offered something quite radical, which was to tell people in a society in which there were a large proportion of slaves, in which um, there was a lot of feudal labor, there was no sense really that all people were equal. It told people, you are all equal. And that was a revolution. Men and women flocked to Christianity as a cult at that time because, because of this promise, you know, especially those at the bottom of society's heap. This was something liberating. What you see over time, though, is that the institutions of religion, like Christianity, like Judaism, like Islam, however radical and exciting they were to people at the beginning, the institutions become co-opted into these uh, patriarchal aims of the state. Um, that gradually, you know, the people in charge start to reflect those in power. 
and the texts get interpreted in such a way that uh, they serve those ideals. Why is it that the Vatican today is obsessed with people having babies? I mean, just always <laughs> don't have sex unless you're having babies, have as many babies as possible. Why would they care? What difference does it make to them? What happens within your own family and how many children you have? Because it comes back to what the state is interested in. The state was always, that was one of their central aims that you have more babies. Um, so we can see this happens over a very long period of time until, of course, we look to the present and these institutions are overwhelmingly patriarchal. They're deeply embedded in those same patriarchal aims to the point where in the 19th century, as women's rights activists in the US were starting to try and make the case for women's emancipation, they very quickly realized they couldn't do it unless they reinterpreted the Bible. And that's what they did. They wrote the women's Bible. They completely, you know, looked at it from a different direction, completely consistently with what was there, because actually there is a lot of leeway in how you interpret religious texts. Um, and nowadays, of course, when we compare Christianity to Islam or other faiths, um, we think of it as more egalitarian. But that's only because of how it's been interpreted for, for very many decades. And actually the a same tradition exists in Islamic feminism that this same attempt to reinterpret the writings, to say, can we build a religion that is uh, consistent with our social aims, that is progressive and liberal, that achieves the social equality that we want while still being true to us? I'm not religious myself, but we have to be able to ask ourselves that if we were, if, you know, if we were to have a truly equal anti-patriarchal society, we do have to ditch or at least question everything. Religion, marriage, the state, capitalism, everything. And that is not an easy pill to swallow. But through reform, we can get to where we want while bringing people along with us. And that's what traditions like um, feminism within Christianity have done. That's what Islamic feminists try to do. Um, and, you know, as uncomfortable as that might be for those of us who are more revolutionary, in our aims, who would love to see everything overturned. That approach actually gets you there faster because it carries everyone along. Side note about, um, about oh, thank you. Um, ancient Greece and how misogynist it was. I always thought that the fear of the female goddesses went hand in hand with misogyny because when <laughs> there's misogyny, there's a fear of wom women, not just a hatred. Mm -hmm. um, I always thought that even when I was a child. Um, let me just look at these new questions. Um, oh, let's, oh, these are some big questions. Um, okay. How about this one? How do we invite men into this conversation about gender equality with the patriarchy deeply entrenched in today's society in the U.S. and the Western world in general? Um, that's a very good question. And I do think, you know, in feminist movements, we've done such a good job of presenting a vision to women and girls that is empowering and exciting. And we haven't done the same for boys, um, which is why, to some degree, we get these incel movements and people gravitating to these people like Andrew Tate and Jordan Peterson, who essentially ask young men to lean into patriarchy, to say, okay, if this is the vision of masculinity that's offered to you by this system, you just go with it and it will deliver you what you want. Forgetting, of course, that patriarchy is not the rule of all men over all women. It's not about this blanket male domination of men over all women. It was always the rule of the patriarchs, those at the very top. And Almost all of us are disadvantaged by that. You only have to look at those poor young men in Russia now being forced to go out and fight and possibly die to know that it isn't working for a lot of young men. And we have to be able to present a narrative to them that says gender equality is also good for you. It takes you out of that box. It doesn't constrain you anymore. It doesn't say to you that you have to live up to these ridiculously narrow ideals, that you can be whatever you want in an expansive way, in the same way that we tell women that, that you can love your wife and it can be a happy relationship that you have, or that you can transcend marriage, that we can imagine a different way of organizing families, that you, there doesn't have to be a tension between generations, between parents and their children, um, that we can imagine, you know, 
a completely different way of being that focuses on you as an individual, that gives you complete freedom and that doesn't place you in a box. Um, and I think that's really, that's also the work of feminism. You know, to say, to be able to say to men and boys, this is also good for you. Yeah, I mean, speaking of hidden history, there were, you know, there was a men's liberation movement in the 70s that was kind of little known, but um, but real and tangible. And then it sort of actually devolved into the men's rights movement kind of <laughs> seamlessly, which is very upsetting. Um, one of the guys, Warren Farrell, who started the men's liberation movement, ended up sort of being the godfather of those guys, the kinder, gentler, like, godfather. So it can... It can Go take a wrong turn, but Again. I totally <laughs> yeah. agree. Um, okay. Um, this is kind of a, a finite one, but it's interesting. Um, how close are we to, I assume this means passing the ERA? Do you know about the ERA? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I was fact, like, you're British. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, um, you know, I mentioned Phyllis, uh, Phyllis Schlafly. I'm right. so sorry. I have such trouble saying that name. It's a, <laughs> Every time. Twister, it's a hard fair. one um, <laughs> in my book because um, part of kind of part of the founding project of the United States was this idea that women should be domesticated. The founding fathers were hugely committed. Um, this is why women were not given the vote from the beginning. Um, this is why we still have this ideal of dom domesticity in the, in the United States that some people really still buy into, um, that there is a place for men and women. And um, Schlafly really kind of bolstered that, you know, part of this sometimes termed by scholars Republican woman, this woman who, who is prominent, but her prominence is really through um, her role as a wife and mother that she has political influence through being a wife and mother. And um, that is exactly how the founding fathers imagined the role of women in public life, was that they would exercise their influence vicariously through the, through the men of their family. And she you know, almost single-handedly managed to tank the ERA as a product of that, um, essentially by making the case that we, you know, we are women and this is our women's role and this would take all of that away, our identity as women. And we still see that now. I mean, without a doubt, there, are, there is still a tension, I think, between women, among women, about what is it that we, <laughs> how is it that we're supposed to live? What is our natural role? Um, which is part of, you know, the constricting thing about patriarchy is to say there can only be one men don't have that it's much more expansive for men but for women it's either one or the other the soviet union said we are all gender equal and m women will study and work like men and the united states response during the cold war was no we are going to domesticate our women and this is their natural place and they will find happiness through that and of course 1960s feminist movement was the reaction to exactly that but can we not have an option where women live how they want? That if you want to be a housewife, you can be a housewife if you want to. If you want to be a house husband, you can be a house husband if you want to, without placing the baggage or the burden of saying everyone has to live that way or that's appropriate for everyone. It's obviously not appropriate for everyone. Um, the difficulty here, of course, is how we divide work. Until we solve that basic question of um, unpaid work at home, domestic work, and paid work outside the home, which is very weird when you think about it, that as societies we have built everything this way. But again, this is a product of this kind of property ownership and creating a class of people who will work for free. Um, then it's always going to be a kind of stumbling block for American society because work is not valued in the same way. Um, but to imagine that all women want the same thing, they, we really don't, obviously. I think this is a perfect question to end on, although I'm going to have to paraphrase it because it's very general, but it's relevant. Um, this says, what does an ideal society look like? Any current examples? <laughs> um, let's go off of what you were just saying. Is there any society, a current society, mm -hmm. maybe one on the map that you have in your book, that is really figuring, not perfect, ideal, mm. but really figuring this out in a way that could inspire us? 
Um, I think there are takeaways uh, from matrilineal societies, there's no doubt. And like I said, every single one is different. Um, one of the examples I give in the book is of uh, Nairs in Kerala. So Kerala is very famous in India. It's described, you know, in legend as this matriarchal state. It's not really matriarchal. I mean, women do um, clearly have uh, many of the same problems there as they do in other states. But relatively, rates of literacy are very, very high. Um, and they have been ever since records have been kept between men and women. There's a very small gap in literacy between men and women, unlike in other Indian states. Um, rates of education are very high. It's very, it's compared to other parts of India, it's um, very easy for women to travel there. And you feel much safer as a woman there. Women are visible on the streets. Um, and part of the reason for that is that traditionally the um, state, one of the most influential groups in the state were the Nairs, this kind of royal kingdom in which people lived in these huge extended families um, in these huge houses called Taravads. And uh, there would be a, the eldest female would be the kind of head of this household. And um, social norms were completely different. I mean, we can't even imagine if you haven't grown up in this society and it was shocking to people who encountered it from outside you know that in one uh, one memoir which recounts kind of living in this Taravad family that the oldest woman in the house she would routinely be completely topless all the time because it was just like normal and natural that this is just how we live there's no sense that I have to be modest or anything because she is the ultimate authority in that household who cares she can wear what or whatever she doesn't want to wear um and, you know, again, it was um, Christian missionaries, settler colonialists who, or colonialists, British colonialists, who kind of tore apart these norms and changed it to the point where in the 1970s, so this is after the British had left India, um, matrilineal was abolished in Kerala by legislature. Um, after, you know, many, many, many decades of these kind of slowly chipping away at it. But recently... Um, some schools in Kerala, state schools, have introduced gender-neutral uniforms, which have been really enthusiastically taken up. Everyone's really excited about it. And the way they frame that is to say, this is our tradition. So in the same way that in other places in the world, you see a reaction to equality with people saying, no, pay, you know, this is our tradition, and they almost always mean patriarchy is our tradition. In Kerala, it's exactly the opposite, which just goes to show that tradition is really what you make it, how you want to interpret it. We can create our new traditions. There's nothing set in stone about these things. Nothing is eternal about our social setup. We have invented all of it, and some of it very recently. It hasn't been around forever. Um, and that's a lesson I want people to take, is not to look to some dream matrilineal society and say, let's just copy that. What I want you to do is look at them and say, anything is possible. We can create the new society that we want in the way that we want it. And there's actually nothing stopping us from doing it. Mm -hmm. Angela, thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.